you fall right through the center of the Earth. Gravity is one of the four fundamental forces of the universe, alongside electromagnetism, the strong force, and the weak force. If you study to become an animator, one of the first things you'll learn is how to add weight to characters and objects, so they don't appear to just be floating above the ground. In live action, you have the opposite problem. Since most movies are filmed on Earth, the downward pull of gravity is a natural part of every scene. So, if a filmmaker wants to change the direction of gravity, make the characters walk on walls, or even dance on the ceiling, it takes considerable effort and a lot of engineering know-how. What fascinates me is that the same techniques can affect the audience in totally different ways. One filmmaker may be striving for scientific realism, while another creates a fantastical nightmare. In this video, I'll be talking about not just how these effects are achieved, but why anyone would want their set flip turned upside down and I'd like to take them in. People often mistakenly cite Royal Wedding, starring Fred Astaire, as the first instance of turning the set upside down, but it actually goes back to the silent era. Walter Booth might have been the first person to try filming a scene with the camera upside down in 1899 with the appropriately titled Upside Down, or The Human Flies. Turning the camera upside down continues to be an effective way to make characters look like they're clinging to the ceiling. In this shot from Aliens, for example, the costumed actors are actually crawling on the ground, with an upside-down camera above them. Sometimes filmmakers will turn the camera sideways to make it appear as if the characters are climbing vertically, or they'll just build the entire set on its side. Holy human flies! The great Georges Méliès, as you would probably assume, developed a very simple camera trick, laying the set on the ground and suspending the camera from above. 66 years later, the makers of Barbarella did the same thing with a sheet of glass instead of a black backdrop, and replacing Melies with Jane Fonda. Some people might consider this an improvement, but that's not really for me to judge. You've also probably seen modern versions of this technique on Instagram and TikTok, which are basically indistinguishable from early silent films anyways. But those are all static shots on an unmoving set, rather than The whole world goes flippity-flop like a turtle on his back. Conceptually, moving the set around the actor is straightforward. The camera is locked down in relation to the set, rather than the ground. To the viewer, the room appears static, while the character moves in impossible ways. Well, the camera never knows that the set is moving. The camera and the floor are married, so that whenever the floor is not on its level, the camera is unaware of it because it doesn't see off that floor. Therefore, if the floor is on the ceiling, it isn't on the ceiling to the camera. The camera just sees it as right side up. The first time someone turned an entire set upside down during the shot was the Douglas Fairbanks starring vehicle When the Clouds Roll By, made all the way back in 1919. It's credited to Victor Fleming as his directorial debut, but the dream sequence featuring the rotating room was actually directed by Joseph Henneberry for an entirely different movie, His Majesty the American. If you want to learn more about this strange credit dispute, which somehow involves Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations, read my Substack article linked in the description below. The scene was part of a longer dream sequence where Fairbanks' character is running from giant vegetables. All pretty normal. It was Henneberry's idea to build the set inside a giant barrel, so Fairbanks could run along the walls and ceiling. Douglas Fairbanks was a leading man who loved to perform his own stunts. The Tom Cruise of his day. He thought the concept was a fantastic challenge, and for the first time in cinema history, we have a character truly... Upside down. The set features an unusual element that hasn't been replicated in other versions of the rotating room trick a flight of stairs. If I had to guess, I'd say there's probably two reasons for this. First, modern safety regulations would probably add extra complexity and cost to the build. Second, unlike most of the movies described in this video, When the Clouds Roll By was filmed in a 4-3 aspect ratio, which lends itself to more vertical staging. See my recent posts on the Too Much Film School substack for more on aspect ratios. So why include the stairs at all? Remember, this is the first time anyone has ever seen the rotating room gag. The stairs set up the expectation that Fairbanks is going to flee upwards, which he does, just not in the way the audience expects. The sequence also attempts a trick which is difficult even with more advanced technology, showing characters upside down and right side up in the same shot. It starts with a subtle jump cut that Fairbanks helps hide by making this little gesture here, a trick that, again, is still used to this day. Because your eye is focused up here, you're less likely to notice the cut down here. 
This distracts from the split screen created entirely in camera, first by matting out half of the screen to record the ceiling, then rewinding the film and doing the opposite for the floor. Fairbanks is actually doing a pull-up here while the actors in vegetable costumes try to keep their fronds from crossing the mat line. As far as I've been able to determine, and I'm risking Cunningham's law here, that was the first and last time anyone tried a revolving set until Royal Wedding. Fred Astaire says he came up with the idea in the 1920s, so it's possible he had seen When the Clouds Roll By, although I can't find a specific record of that. The Royal Wedding set is more filled out, with furniture, paintings, even hanging lights. All that set dressing needed to be secured during the room rotation, which allowed for more interaction between Astaire and his surroundings. In particular, before the room starts flipping over, he dances with a chair. Then later, he does this. It's a better trick than Fairbanks hanging from the banister, since the audience wouldn't assume that the chair is fixed in place. And of course, this picture had to be secured with sticky tack or something similar, so it wouldn't fall until Astaire grabbed it. In addition to the physical differences, the scenes embody very different tones. Fairbanks' dream sequence was surreal, while Astaire's dance portrays the exuberance of love. Interestingly, Royal Wedding is the only movie in this video essay that has no narrative justification for flipping the set over. It's not a dream or hallucination. He's not in outer space. It's simply genre conventions that allow Astaire to dance around the room. As Bob Fosse once said, It's showtime, folks. The time to sing is when your emotional level is too high to just speak anymore. And the time to dance is when your emotions are just too strong to only sing about how you feel. Fred Astaire goes further, dancing on the walls and the ceilings, but of course, he's not the only one who's dancing on the ceiling. Stanley Donnan later produced the 58th Academy Awards. He met with Lionel Richie to discuss his performance of Say You, Say Me, which went on to win the Oscar that night. Just so happens when he walked in the room, we were doing Dancing on the Ceiling. And he, of course, he said, you know, I did the first Fred Astaire Dancing on the Ceiling. Have you made up your mind yet about a director for your video? I said, uh, well, we have a few names in the pot. He said, well, would you consider me? Not only would I consider you, you can do it. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. It took Fred Astaire as solo all by himself six weeks to work on this little thing of walking on the ceiling. We did it in a week and a half, really. Four days of actual practice. And I must tell you that I could have used about another four of Fred six to make it work. Lionel likes to make you think that he can't dance, but he can. The music video wound up being even more complicated than the feature film, with more dancers and a larger set. In fact, the crew had to build three identical sets. One set was built the normal way, one was entirely upside down, and of course there was the rotating set. Just went to the set now, we're making some additional changes in this set, which means we have to change this set, and then we have to change that set. Everything we do has to be done three times, one time upside down. So it's tricky. Besides running along the walls, some party goers even flip directly from the floor to the ceiling. Everything has to be nailed in place. You know, we tack the earrings to the ears. We sew the necklace to the neck. Like when the clouds roll by, this video once again attempts to show people on both the floor and the ceiling at the same time. In the upside down set, we shoot the people standing on the ceiling with the illusion of them being upside down because the camera's upside down. We use a blue screen in conjunction with the upside down set. The electronic technology of chroma key is used. We use the color blue because it's the opposite of the skin tone. You can take and make a separation mat and lift out just the subject that's in front of the blue screen and put it on top of the background plate. The effect might have worked on the cathode ray tube TV sets of the 1980s, but in HD it's less convincing than the split screen effect from 100 years ago. For technical excellence that still holds up today, we have to jump back to the year 1968, which was looking ahead to the year... <laughs> In the same way that Fred Astaire was probably inspired by an own silent movie, many sources say that Stanley Kubrick was likely influenced by an obscure Russian film, Daroga Zyozdem, or Road to the Stars. Made ten years prior to A Space Odyssey, the propaganda film for the Soviet space program utilized extensive wire work and, more relevant for the purposes of this video, a rotating set. You can see by this telltale pose that the actor playing the astronaut is bracing himself for the rotation. It's something the cast of 2001 managed to avoid, thanks in part to what was probably the largest kinetic set ever built. 
The centrifuge set was also incredibly expensive, $750,000 out of a budget of around 10 to 12 million. Being larger and entirely self-contained, it was more complex than any of the revolving sets we've seen so far. Naturally, all of the props and set dressing had to be secured, but so was the equipment that the audience never sees. Despite appearances, none of these monitors were actually flat screens, like the one you're probably watching this video on right now. They're rear projections. Fifteen projectors were all perfectly synced, so they wouldn't flicker or throw light unevenly. But on the very first test run, no one thought to clip the film reels in place. As the centrifuge rolled over, every one of the 30 reels of film fell clattering to the floor. The rotating sets I've already mentioned previously in this video were mostly filmed from roughly the same perspective. The fourth wall! Look! See? What, y'all don't number the walls? Clouds and wedding utilized long takes, which were characteristic of the times they were filmed, cutting only to set up trick shots. Dancing on the ceiling varies the focal length a bit and is cut more rapidly, sacrificing visual clarity for rhythm, which is a valid choice for a music video. 2001, on the other hand, uses a wide variety of camera angles and dwells on them for extended periods. The effect immerses the audience in the reality of zero gravity. The centrifuge uh, is so realistic and so unusual, after a while you begin to forget that you're an actor and you begin to really feel like an astronaut. So while the other rotating room shots could be lit primarily from outside the set, which you can see by the shadows on the back wall, that wouldn't work for Space Odyssey. Because the centrifuge was entirely self-contained, all the lighting had to be attached to the rotating drum. The thing is, movie lights at the time were vented at the top. Turning them upside down would cause them to overheat, sometimes even exploding the bulbs. Unlike the projector reels, there was no easy fix for this. Douglas Trumbull, who created many of the film's amazing effects, said it was a scary place to work, under the constant barrage of exploding glass every time the centrifuge turned over. I've got a hundred people down here and they're covered with glass. Glass? Who gives a shit about glass? Despite the fire hazard, Kubrick and cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth sought to cover the scenes from as many creative angles as possible. The crew planned two categories of shots, those when the set was stationary and those when it was rotating. The former weren't much more complicated than traditional coverage, although the curved floor was a minor inconvenience. The latter type was divided into two further subcategories. Those where the camera moved with the set, which made it appear stationary while the actors moved around it, and those where the camera remained static, thus tricking the eye into thinking the camera was moving around the centrifuge. What is happening? I'm very confused. The Vickers Armstrong Engineering Group built the centrifuge as two giant disks, which met perfectly in the middle and only a narrow strip of rubber between them. The camera could be mounted on a light compact dolly which was secured to the stage floor with a narrow blade. As the set rotated, the camera remained in place, with the blade slicing between the rubber matting and the dolly wheels turning. To give the illusion of moving around the centrifuge, the actor would have to run in place while the room rotated around him. It was essentially a giant version of the human hamster wheel from Double Dare. When the camera was intended to appear stationary in relation to the set, camera operator Kelvin Pike and camera assistant John Alcott rode a platform secured to the wall with the camera on a gyroscopic mount. They did have to be careful to keep their feet out of the shots, especially ones like this. This ladder here actually starts out facing downward in this shot. Gary Lockwood is strapped into his seat upside down as Cure Delay climbs down the ladder. At that point, the set begins to rotate, bringing Lockwood to Delay, who is really just walking in place. While at the same time, the camera is lifted 35 feet into the air. Alcott said it was like going to a fairground. And while the giant centrifuge gets most of the attention, it wasn't the only rotating set. Production designer Anthony Masters came up with the idea for this shot, where the astronauts transition from a corridor to the rotating centrifuge. The set was built as two barrels in line with each other, each able to rotate independently, like a kaleidoscope. What? A kaleidoscope? I'm not five. Shapes and colors, the likes of which I've never seen. The camera was locked to the near cylinder. As the actors step onto the further part of the set, it's stopped while the closer barrel begins rotating at the same time. Interestingly, when it was explained to him, Kubrick didn't get it. Speak as you might to a young child or a golden retriever. It wasn't brains that got me here, I can show you of that. Masters had to spend half a night in the director's office drawing sketches until he was finally able to wrap his head around it at about one in the morning. Much simpler was the shot of the stewardess on the Orion 3, just another set on a revolving gimbal. People debated for years whether or not it was actually possible to walk so smoothly in a circle, even with Velcro shoes, in zero gravity. 
astronaut Samantha Christopher Reddy settled the matter once and for all in 2022, 21 years after the film was originally set. Although it's still really not as practical as just floating around. And so the Space Odyssey, released just one year before the first moon landing, proved to be both prescient and accurate in mesmerizing ways. Returning to the 1980s, we've got another movie that's mesmerizing in entirely different ways. I had to cut this section down to YouTube's monetization standards, but it still may be too intense for some viewers. So if you have sensitive children, maybe you should tuck them into bed early tonight instead of writing us angry letters tomorrow. Or you can just skip to this time code here. On the other hand, if you want the uncensored version, you can find it on the Too Much Film School website. Thanks for your attention. For the first kill of the movie, director Wes Craven wanted a scene that was surreal. Somebody there? as Tina's nightmares about Freddy Krueger crossed over into reality. Getting into what I have coined as rubber reality, all sorts of strange illusions that uh, haven't been treated in films since Cocteau. I think. Films that deal with the way that reality can be distorted, going into dream states. Once again, the filmmakers took their cue from cinema history. The idea actually came from the Fred Astaire film Royal Wedding, which had a great sequence of him dancing around the rotating room. You can do that? I said, well, I think we can. So I went, went ahead and looked at the, the logistics. So, yeah, I, th I think we can do this. We spent a month to get this thing done, built the framework, and then built the room inside of that. Nightmare had a much smaller budget, though. They didn't have large machines controlling the rotation. We turned the room by hand, me and three or four guys. It was very spooky when it was turning all by itself. It was horrifying. I mean, it was the only scene I think I've ever been part of that was more frightening in real life. What if it falls off its hinges? Or what if somebody falls out of the hole and lands on the ground? It just seemed like so much could go wrong. I was pretty scared going into that. I was afraid for my own physical safety because I kept thinking things were going to fall on me. I thought I was going to fall out. This has a lot of elements to it that seem really dangerous. The only thing was as soon as anybody walked into the room, they got totally nauseous because it was so disorienting. I look up and there's the bed above me. Completely freak out. I get complete and utter vertigo and I start to feel that I'm falling. Wes's head comes through this hole in the floor and he's like, look, I am standing on the floor. This is my head. You're on the floor. You're looking right at me. While the Space Odyssey production was able to afford multiple rotating sets, the Nightmare crew saved money by reusing the same revolving room. And then we took the same room and used it as Johnny Depp's room for the head sequence. Really inspired by Kubrick a little bit. As The Shining had come out, and there was that scene with the blood spilling out of the elevators. And I thought if he could get away with it, I could. Not only did they reuse the set, but Craven recycled the whole concept in his meta-horror film, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, the seventh of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. I like that movie. It was scary. Well, well, the first one was, but the rest sucked. In both films, Craven showed a thin separation between nightmares and reality. Decades later, another filmmaker took the idea of dreams bleeding into waking life and flipped that whole concept on its head. I, I see what you did there. Inception is about unseen forces controlling everything around us. Each level of the dream world is affected by the one above it, beyond the character's range of knowledge. Joseph Gordon-Levitt doesn't know the van he fell asleep in is now rolling down a hill. He just knows the hotel is tumbling around him. I have turned the world upside down. This is similar to a car crash or a boat capsizing, but since a whole building doesn't normally flip over, I decided it was still okay to include this scene in the video. The characters aren't defying gravity so much as the entire location is. As you might have guessed, director Christopher Nolan was inspired by Kubrick's 2001. I mean, the idea of using a centrifuge to manipulate gravity. It's been done on various films, most notably Kubrick's 2001. Uh, and I like the idea of repurposing that technology and really trying to, to choreograph an entire fight sequence and camera movement and all the rest. Really do something that could be completely in camera in a way that you know, I hadn't, hadn't seen before. The hallway set is even longer than the diameter of the big centrifuge in that movie. And the filmmakers take full advantage of the set's size by starting the scene off with a long take. It really is stunning. And we did elect to play it in one shot, simply because our immediate uh, response when you first see the footage is, it just doesn't look possible. It's very clever. 
When the characters fall into a hotel room, we see a couple of new twists on the rotating room concept. For one thing, the crew deliberately did not attempt to secure the props and costumes and set decorations. Also, because the room wasn't square or round with respect to the axis of rotation, the special effects crew actually had to modulate the speed of the revolution. We designed to rotate at six revs per minute and we got the stunt people in there because of it had a one long side and one short side. Uh, it quickly became apparent that they couldn't get across that. The long sides it were at six RPM, they were really struggling, so we had to gear it down. In actual fact, when we do that shot, we speed up and slow down the revolution wherever they are on the rig. So if they were going along the long side, we slow it down, and then when they go across the short side, we speed it up. This introduced an element of real world danger. The game is very different than when we were in the corridor. If you mess up and get behind the rotation, you can fall and really hurt yourself. Whereas in the corridor, you're only falling eight feet or something and have pads, so it didn't feel great, but it's not a big deal. When you fall 20 or 30 feet, that's bad. If you start looking outside, you get motion sickness, you, get, you do physically get disorientated, so it's keeping inside of this environment. And I mean, the director tried it, I tried it. It was not easy, and he far exceeded what we did. As the scene continues, the editing accelerates, in part to hide the stunt performers, but also to utilize different angles to help the audience identify with the characters. As with 2001, sometimes the camera moves with the set, and sometimes it moves with the actors. To be honest, it kind of becomes a jumble of intensified continuity, relying more on the sound than the image for coherence and intelligibility. But the reality of the falling props and actors still sells us on the surreality of the dream state. So many action movies now, and it's all done on computers later. Whereas these scenes that we did, it was so well thought out. It's just the things revolving, and it's up to me to keep my balance. And, and we did the performance, and they shot it, and that's that. While building a real set and really tossing actors around has its advantages, that's not to say that computer technology can't be employed to enhance the rotating room effect. The pilot episode of Euphoria features another rotating hallway, but this time it's not a dream. I was thinking about you know her, her drug use and, and how do we depict the highs of it. Once again, the long, continuous shot invests the audience in the reality of the scene, so we're not prepared for the world to suddenly go topsy-turvy. As with Nolan and Kubrick, pilot director Augustine Frizzell keeps the camera moving with Rue so we can feel her mental state. Everything is just spinning and you have no sense of where the real world is in comparison to where you are. And let's just say that like I'm experiencing this crazy thing with the room. The camera's movement, as well as the sets, isolates her from the rest of the characters. Affecting the audience in this way required a complex mixture of special effects and visual effects. These background actors were strapped into position, turning upside down with the set, like we've seen before. I did not envy those people because they must have had like crazy head rush. But what about these characters, who are walking on the floor while Rue is climbing up the walls and ceiling? The construction department built a replica hallway, this time flat on a regular stage floor. The Technocrane recorded the camera's movements on the rotating set, and that data was inverted to reverse engineer the camera move on the static set. Then, visual effects technicians combined the two shots, making it appear that people were moving around on the floor while the lead character was upside down on the ceiling. It's kind of a high-tech, motion-controlled version of the split-screen effect in When the Clouds Roll By, which was released almost exactly 100 years earlier. For over a century, filmmakers have been rotating sets to portray dreams and nightmares, hard science fiction and magical realism. Come on up! All while confusing Rodney Dangerfield. Oh, I shouldn't have eaten that upside-down cake! Though the technology has evolved, the uncanny effect of an actor defying gravity still fascinates us. Obviously, I wasn't able to cover every single time a movie, TV show, or music video has turned the world upside down. Let me know in the comments if I missed a favorite of yours. You can find a list of sources and movies used in this video on my Substack, linked in the description below. You can also support this channel by becoming a paid subscriber on Substack. You'll get these videos early, including extra footage that YouTube's copyright gnomes won't let me use. If you liked this video, hit the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button. And if you want your friends to know what great taste you have in video essays, hit the share button. Thanks for watching.